What is this week? 12? No, 11 or 12? 11. 11 of 16. After tonight, we've got four more classes. Seniors, raise your hands. All right, man, stay with us. Stay with us. It's going to be a good one. All right, so congratulations on turning in your assignment number two on success and failure. Uh, you've completed two of the three required uh, tasks for the class. The final assignment. Your personal philosophy is due the last class, April 27th. Um, I encourage you to review the requirements for the assignment in the syllabus as prompts uh, and use advice and examples from class, including tonight especially, right, to incorporate or even refute in your personal philosophy. To be clear again, all questions regarding assignments and attendance and administrative in administration of the class go to John Park first before they were made. If there's something that can't be solved and an excellent sense. Our remaining schedule tonight, we have Jane Werwin. Uh, next week, we have a double header uh, for about 20 or 30 minutes from New York, Guy Winch, uh, very well known TED talk on emotional hygiene and repairing a broken heart is gonna talk to us for 20 or 30 minutes, followed by Sean Bruner of Avant Stay, which recently raised $500 million for it's a residential rental platform for remote working. On April 12th, it's a bonus. You're not required, but it's a way for us to have some fun and celebrate. We have uh, Jacob Collier, five-time Grammy Award winning musician in Bovard Auditorium uh, on creativity and music, and how he creates music. And that's something I'd say don't miss. It's really, uh, really a special night. Uh, following that on April 13th, what is that? Two weeks from now, uh, David Roger, the founder of Masterclass, is coming to speak with us. And then on April 20th, uh, someone that I've really sort of followed on social media and read his book, and I highly recommend it. We're on a book run here. A lot of great authors coming in. Not known for being authors first, but authors second. Um, his name is Young Pueblo, is his pen name. His, uh, his real name is Diego Perez. Uh, his book is called Clarity and Connection. It is the easiest read you'll ever, it's deep, but it's the easiest read because there's only like one paragraph on each page. You can consume it in a night or two. Um, we'll be talking about his thoughts on everything from self-talk, to understanding who you are, to relationships, to ego, to healing from trauma, and all these things around a healthy mindset. I'm really excited to meet him and, and learn from that. So including tonight, we have five classes, plus a party with Jacob Collier. So here's my thing to all of you, especially seniors. Let's, let's squeeze every ounce of fun and meaning and shared experience into these last five weeks and really get the most out of it. Um, I promise you that you're gonna remember a lot of these things from class for decades um, and it will have a difference in your life. So let's, uh, let's stick together even after Coachella, all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. Uh, Jane Werwin is an entrepreneur, author, and advocate whose mission is to open doors to economic empowerment for women and underrepresented communities around the world. Jane is the co-founder and chief visionary of Dermalogica and the International Dermal Institute, two transformational brands in the professional skincare industry. Tonight, we'll learn how she and her partner and husband started these businesses in a small space in Marina del Rey and grew them to the number one professional, skin, professional skincare line in the world used by more than 100,000 professional therapists across 100 countries. In 2018, Jane launched Found LA to fund, mentor, and offer incubation programs and educational resources for local entrepreneurs who have been underserved or overlooked. All profits from the sale of her book, this book, which I've already highly recommended, are donated to Found LA to support entrepreneurs to build their businesses, purpose, and community. Jane has served as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship to develop the next generation of entrepreneurs in the US and abroad, and as a special advisor to the UN's Foundation's Global Entrepreneurs Council. She was named one of 30 world-changing women by Conscious Company Media, and her expertise is sought out in print, podcasts, and TV, including Bloomberg, MSNBC, Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine, and NPR's How I Built This Podcast, among many others. We have a lot to cover tonight. Please welcome Jane Irwin. Jane. It's so good to see you. It's up to me. It's for you whenever you need it. Do you want to play your foot instead? Okay, no, no, no. I'll jump out. 
Welcome. Isn't it good to see like, live people? Yes, yeah, live really nice. people. I'm going to take it all in. Yeah. That's so Very nice. Good. Thank you. Smiling faces. You've always been so generous with your time at USC. You uh, were one of our headline uh, speakers at the Dean Newman Summit a couple of years ago. You've been in the class. So just let me say thanks again. It's so kind to us. It's so nice to have you here. Um, we, the class is on mindset more than skill set. But as we sort of have found out, those techniques and things that we want them to learn our habits and skills in and of themselves, how you respond to situations, how you practice, how you build habits. So much of that is, is in the book. So the three things we want to talk about is a little bit about your background, the context, uh, so students don't think <coughs> you were born into being a, 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 a mogul of the, of the skin industry, far from that. Um, talk about your business career and, and also uh, mindset topics. I want to involve them as much as possible. So they're going to be asking questions as we go along. Many of them have submitted questions. So let's just sort of stay around the topics that we're talking about. But because her experience is so vast, we probably will jump around a little bit. So first, we'll just be background. I'll handle that. And then we'll get into a business career. You guys can jump in. And then we'll talk about mindset. All right. So ready? Yeah. All right. Well, let's start with, with, with your background and where you were born, how many kids in the family, and what happened early in your life that shaped your family and perspective as a child? It's great to be here. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. And uh, can all of you hear me? Can you turn it up a little bit? Thanks. So I was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. And it's interesting because next week on Wednesday, I'm going back to Scotland for several weeks. Ooh, thank you to visit my family uh, who now live on the Isle of Mull, which is in the Inner Hebrides. And if you've never heard of Mull, don't worry, because people that live on Mull actually have no idea where that is. <laughs> um, it's a tiny little island uh, off the coast of Scotland. I was born in Edinburgh. Um, I was born the youngest of four children, four girls. And uh, my mom and dad, um, we're happily married and everything going well. It looked like a traditional setup until one weekend. Um, my father had a heart attack, died over the weekend, and my mother was left at age 38 with four children to raise on her own. Now, this was 1961, so it's last century, so long ago. And as was the law then, my mother had trained as a professional nurse, but once she was married, the law was, as a woman, you had to give up your job to a single woman, a married woman, who needed the job more than you did because now your husband was going to support you. It was that way for nursing until 1972 in the UK. It was much the same way in the United States. And it was the same if you were a teacher, which explains why so many women teachers were single and never married. Because the minute they did, they'd have to give up their job. So my mother had not worked since she had married, which was many years before. She didn't know how to drive. She had no financial literacy. She had no support system. There was no trust fund. There was a heavy mortgage they'd just taken out a few months before on their first home. And my father died with the insurance on the mortgage in his pocket, unsigned. So my mother was left in a really difficult situation. And yet, because she had a skill set as a nurse, she got a job within a week, working nights, and kept our family together. So I was raised by a working mom who worked seven in the evening till seven in the morning. I was two years old when my dad died. And so I, I felt like I had a really privileged, magical childhood for all kinds of reasons. But I could easily tell this story as a tragic story. My mom was fantastic. She kept it together. She was very strong. She told every one of us, learn how to do something. Because if you are ever left as I was, you must be able to provide for yourself. Always have a separate bank account. Never merge your bank accounts except for expenses. And you better understand how financial literacy works, because I never did, and therefore I want each of my daughters to. 
And I was raised um, in that family in Edinburgh, Scotland. And so the five words that she gave you that are woven throughout your life are learn how to do something. Learn how to do something. Have a skill that you can sell. Have a skill. It's not about just an education. It's about knowing how to do something. And that is critically important. And you know, I look at the what's happening, it happens continually around the world, but we're witnessing now what's happening in Ukraine. And I'm looking at the people that are coming out as refugees. If they have a skill set, they will be the first ones to work, despite the fact that they may not understand the language of whatever country they end up going to. Yeah, it's always sort of, I'd say, plan A, plan B as you go through life. That all else goes to hell, I can do that. <laughs> exactly. uh, I've said the same thing about being a lawyer. If I, have to do that, I, do that. But yeah. I, I hope this isn't only personal, but this class is sort of like you can the, do this. the students <laughs> buy in and, and you know, we're we're part of a club that no one wants to be in, you know, the children of uh, parents who die young. And, um, you know, you feel so odd and different when it happens to you when you're younger, particularly in school. And what I've learned through talking to so many students this semester is that uh, it's not as rare as you think. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have lost parents uh, early in their lives. Can you talk about how that shaped you? You know, you have the benefit of having a couple more decades, I do, a couple more decades than they do. I remember at 18 or 20, you know, when I was thinking about it, it's much different than now. Yeah. Can you give us a little bit of reflections on how it shaped you, how it's made you, and maybe some of the positive things that you know, no one would choose, obviously, yeah. but maybe some of the things that it's done for you, for your attitude. Well, something I believe in, in all of our lives, and I, I talk about this in the book, is that the truly hard experiences, the really authentic, tough experiences are the ones that ultimately, I think, guide us and shape us. And maybe that's just a way of intellectually being able to kind of justify or give a narrative to the fact that this terrible thing happened. But I can actually thread back all the things that happened to me in my life, and I thread it back to that actual that incident of my dad dying. Because the first thing that happened when I was, because I was so small, I didn't really understand what happened. And people wouldn't say, they didn't ever say to me when you know I was three years old, four years old, five years old, you know, he's dead. So people said, you know, your dad, your dad's gone away. Well, when is he coming back? And why? You know, I had this concept that he was going gone away and coming back. Until I went to school at five years old, and I realized, actually four and a half in Scotland, and I realized that uh, the fact that I didn't have a parent at home who was male was very unusual, also I thought. And then I became ashamed of it. And so at school, for example, you had to have a, an absence note signed by your father, not a parent, it was father. So consequently, I was never absent. I don't care how sick I was, I was going to school because I was never going to have to try and hand in a note with what, with whose signature. I couldn't even write at that stage, I don't think. Or I probably would have forged one if I could. And so um, when I was about six years old, we started going on field trips, you know, to a museum, to the zoo or wherever we were going. And the teacher said to me, Everyone take a form and you need to bring it back, signed by your father before the field trip. So I took it, stuffed it in my bag and never thought about it. Or did, I did think about it, but never did anything about it. We had two more requests from the teacher to turn in the form and I never did it. Came the day before the field trip and she, and I was, Anderson was my, my, my name. And so I was A and that we seated alphabetically. So I was right there in that seat and her desk was here. And she said, Jane Anderson, stand up. So I stood up. Whole class is behind me, so I can just feel everyone behind me. And she said, where is your, no, your permission slip? And I didn't answer. And she said, I'm talking to you. Where is your permission slip for the field trip? And I said, I, 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 she said, I can't hear you. What did you say? And I just said, I don't, I don't have one. And she said, that's, that's not true. I've given you three already. Now, where is it? And I, I don't know what made me do it, because I actually at that moment thought I was going to wet myself. But I summoned up whatever courage I had. And I said, 
I don't have a father. And she looked at me and said, what are you talking about? And I, and I just said, he's there. And my whole face, I can feel it almost now, just flush. I could feel it. No one could see me but her. And everyone around me, there were some nervous giggles. There were people whispering. I just knew at that minute, I have to step into this. I have to own this. I have to be responsible for myself. This person should know this about me. How does she not know this about me? I'm not going to burst into tears. I am not going to wet myself. I am going to be strong and I'm going to repeat what I just said. And I did. And instead of being, you think she might be highly empathetic or apologize or anything. No, no, no. She just said, sit down, <laughs> which I did. And that was it. It was never mentioned again. She never asked me. She never called me out after break. But in that moment, as, as small as it is, it was huge at that time. It's probably the biggest thing that happened to me. I started to own that story. And I became, instead of being ashamed, I started to become proud of the fact that my mum was raising us and that she was doing a good job and that we were surviving and that we were, you know, held together as a family. That threaded really through everything I did. That idea of, you have to be able to take care of yourself. You have to be able to do something. No one is going to cut you a break and own it. Whatever it is, however bad, however shameful, whatever you imagine it might be, it is your authentic story. And that will always be your North Star. And it always has. To have that type of confidence and awareness at that age, that's something that I think most people, myself included, I just walked away and backed away you didn't want to make people feel uncomfortable because then they would feel uncomfortable so you'd always yeah. answer them around. Sorry, I'm so yeah sorry. or just you know but, <laughs> but just the sooner you can figure that that's something that a you don't control b will help shape you yeah uh, the better uh, i'd rather do it at four than 40 yeah uh, than probably when i started being more proud of it than yeah. shame uh, so that, that story just really touched me. Thank you for sharing that. So you emigrated, uh, immigrated to England at nine. I think you went to Bournemouth, great place. Uh, <laughs> yeah. in, uh, pool in Bournemouth. Yeah. Your first job at 13 was at a beauty salon, yeah. cleaning, right? Yeah. Um, Working Saturday. Work Saturday Underage because you have to be 15 and a half. So I couldn't be seen by any clients. So uh, my whole job was in the staff room which is actually always the most exciting place in the salon anyway, let me just tell you. So I was doing the laundry, cleaning up, going and fetching people's lunches and, you know, whatever else I needed to do, but I couldn't be seen by clients. So for the first year and a half, two years, um, I was in the back room doing the laundry. And uh, you started training yourself as an esthetician, a beautician. Mm -hmm. uh, it took you to uh, Scotland, to South Africa, in January 1984, you arrived in Los Angeles and, and searched for work. Is Tal here? Tal, are you here? You, you have a question about sort of coming as an immigrant in a global perspective? Yeah, sure. So Speak up a little bit. Hold on. Yeah, go, go here. He'll get you up. Okay. I'll try and weave you guys in, those of you who, who posted uh, questions. Thank you for being here. So my question was you were born in Edinburgh, you were born in England before coming to the US. What impact did this global perspective have on you, if any? I think it's critical. I think any anything that has anything any of us have done that might be a bit different from the other people you're going to be in the room with is important. Am I still on? Yeah, I'd turn that off if you don't mind. It might be interfering with my mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anything you've done, it, you know, when you're in a room, uh, whether it's a boardroom, conference room, cocktail party room, whatever it is, if whatever it is about you that's a little different is probably going to be one of the most interesting things about you. So I think a global perspective is, is very important. I didn't realize that at the time. So I, I landed in Los Angeles, there was 10.4% unemployment rate, which incidentally, remember, this is pre-internet, this is pre-laptop, this is pre-computers, pre-everything. I had no idea there was a 10.4% unemployment rate. If I'd known that, I might not come. <laughs> but so, and I, and I had applied to Australia, by the way, and they turned me down because they had a point system and one of the points was, do you speak a foreign language? I think the word was foreign language, other than English. I guess everything is foreign, but um, crazy. 
So the answer was no to that. And the second question was, did I have a university degree or any kind of qualification? You know, definitely not the one I have. And I said no, and that took me out of the point system, which is just a huge blessing because I would much rather have been in LA than Sydney, even though I do like Australia. So I get here, it's 10.4% unemployment. I realize though, as many immigrants do, the thing that I knew the best, which was professional skincare, actually didn't exist in the United States. There were only seven out of the 50 states that had a license. California was one, New York was not. That's why I didn't go to New York, I came here. And uh, I realized how hard it was going to be to get a job because there were only seven salons. They were pretty much all in Beverly Hills that even offered what I had the skills to do. But the next thing I realized was my accent was going to be my superpower because if you had a, a foreign accent, and especially a British accent then, I don't know, people just thought you were smarter than probably you were. <laughs> yeah, I think that still works, right? So... Um, all of that said, I, I could have got a job very quickly, but what I chose to do was see that lack of awareness of my skill set as an opportunity to offer training and education to upskill people who were working in hair salons to be able to offer skincare services, and in doing so, carved out the beginning of an industry which is now you know, prestige skincare is one of the fastest growing segments of any industry and showed growth even through the last two years of the pandemic. So um, that I saw it as an opportunity and used my that global awareness. And all the way through, as we went into foreign markets, uh, overseas markets, Raymond and, my, and myself, we would always look at the market and say, this is a fantastic opportunity. We launched Dermalogica in Malaysia Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Thailand before we had launched in New York. Yeah, because it was, this sounds so bizarre, but it was much easier and also much less expensive to penetrate those markets with messaging. And we didn't take advertising, but I just went relentlessly on tours of teaching there than it would have been Manhattan or New York. So we launched in Australia before we launched in New York. And I think that most people would think that was crazy, but when you've had global experience, it isn't because you understand the market differently. And tell us what you saw, you know, all great businesses start with solving a problem or noticing a need that's not being met. Mm -hmm. You saw plenty of uh, plenty of things about hair care, plenty of products dealing with hair care, yeah. not with skin care. So what was, sort of the competitive advantage that you jumped on and developed? Because you, you didn't start with products first, you started with training first. Yeah, we didn't look, we didn't start with the idea of, oh, we're just gonna develop a product line. First of all, we had no money. We were both immigrants. We were in a one bedroom apartment in Marina Del Rey. Uh, I had a car for that I bought for $600 from a guy at Long Beach Airport. It was a Ford Fairmont, 1978. And, and every time you tried to turn left, it would, the alternator would stop. So you had to turn right every way you went. <laughs> but I was in heaven, you know, I was in Los Angeles and in this big boat of a car and a bench seat in the front. I mean, it was absolutely flipping fantastic. <laughs> so um, we started off by saying, what is the gap? The gap in the market is a lack of skill set around being able to analyze the skin and give professional treatments. I was shocked that people in Los Angeles weren't having a skin treatment like every other day because on television, you know, you sort of got this feeling that everyone was a movie star and everyone had everything done all the time. Absolutely not true. And in that, there was the opportunity. So we, we decided we had to bridge the gap between this four month training, which was typical, still is by the way, and a global education, which I had gone through, and an apprenticeship, which was a two-year full-time study and a one-year apprenticeship, so three years in total. And apprenticeships are so well established, particularly outside of the United States. Europe has a very well established apprenticeship program. So it's not an automatic that you're going to go to university and get a degree. You're probably going to go and do skill set or vocational training. So, but that didn't really exist here. So, especially not in my industry. So we decided we we're gonna write a curriculum, which I did to upskill people who already had a license to work in a salon. They just didn't know anything about skincare. And that became very, very successful. We did that for three years. And then from 1983 to 86, 
And in 1986, we launched Dermalogica, the product line, because we then realized that everyone we were training was saying, well, what product should I use? And there were no American-made professional salon skincare products, which sounds crazy, and I thought it was as well, even then, but it was true. Everyone was using a product they'd imported from Germany, France, Italy, Austria, Switzerland, and paying import taxes and customs duties, et cetera, to get it in the country, which was making the cost of using those products in the salon exorbitant. Otherwise, they were sort of buying drugstore products and using it in the salon, which wasn't acceptable because you're not going to get the results. So the product was the piece that really cemented our journey. So you start by training uh, skincare professionals, and then you start providing products. Um, When did you write the business plan for the company and how long was it? Um, we wrote the business plan. Uh, we'd, we'd gone down, I was the first year, so I came here in January 83. We launched our training in December of 83. And in that year, I was basically training anyone who, who needed any kind of education. I didn't have a classroom or a school, so I would go on site and train people. And La Costa Spa was one of the um, big resorts in, in San Diego County that, uh, that had 90, 90 people who worked in their salon and spa, all of whom were trained as hairdressers and they were teamsters union, which is really kind of strange. However, all 90 needed training in skincare because they just hired a new spa director from London who wanted to introduce skincare and skincare treatments a and B knew me from London and so called me and said, Jane, you've got to come down here to this spa and you've got to train 90 people and do the best job you can. So got in my Ford Fairmont, good job for 405, you don't have to turn left anywhere, just went straight down the freeway and I stayed there three days training them. And when I left, and I clearly it was very rudimentary, but when I drove back, Ray and I drove back from San Diego, that area, it was a two and a half hour drive back to our one bedroom apartment. And on that drive, we put together the business plan for the International Dermal Institute, which is what we were going to call our school. We knew that if we could train 90 Teamsters Union spa workers in San Diego, there was a definite need in Los Angeles and across the country. We got home and at our kitchen table, Raymond sat down on a legal pad of paper, hand wrote out the business plan. And I think it was three and a half pages of legal paper. We still have it, and uh, it worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> and so you you shifted to products as the customer. You, you were, I think you started with, how many SKUs did you start with in Well, we started off with 27 individual formulas and more SKUs than that because some came in a professional size and a retail size. It was a huge amount. It's unheard of. People don't do that. Most people start with one product or maybe four products. I just was reading a piece about a startup. They just launched five products. And people were saying in the trade magazine, you know, that was kind of amazing. We did 27 because we didn't really know that you can't do that. And I needed at least 27 different products to be able to offer the kind of skin treatment I wanted to offer. So it was 27. And again, it was driven by the customers, not by your desire or private equity investors. Speaking of investors, yeah. uh, how did you finance the business? We self-financed on $14,000, period. We never gave away equity, no loans, no partners. And people say, how could you possibly do that? We did it because the salon professional industry is a cash and delivery industry. Still is. Just a little bit to the wise end if you look to your product. It is a cash on delivery business. You deliver your product and UPS pick up the check. And first year sales, do you remember those? I'm sure you do. 200, oh, first year of Demologica? Yeah. Million dollars, just over a million dollars. I know. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's, that, that's 19, <coughs> no, what, what year is that? 1986. 1986. Yeah. Um, can you sort of give us some highlights of how it scaled? And I know by 2014, which is already eight years ago, bizarre. Yeah. Uh, it's up to like 200, you know, it's quarter of a billion. Yeah, 247 million at wholesale. Wholesale, right. Yeah, so that's, you know, 500 
at, at Boomtown. Um, and we scaled it all on that $14,000. It's like Jack's, Jack's magic beans or something, you know, you put in the ground and grow. Sounds like, that makes it sound easy. It was a lot of hard work. It was long days, long years, et cetera. But here's the thing, we knew, first of all, we felt really confident it was gonna work. We already felt we understood the market enough in the three years of education, of teaching different sounds every single day sometimes in our classroom and we're in a direct. The second thing was we had no plan B. We we didn't have we didn't have a legal degree to fall back on just because you did that's that's great. We didn't. I was gonna have to get a job working for someone. I can't do a machine trade. wax either. Well, so. yeah, and I can do a machine wax in seven minutes, as you told me said before. So that is a very stable skill. Um so there was no plan B. This had to work. If it didn't work, uh well, we just didn't even allow ourselves to, to, to go there. It had to work. We, had, we used to say, we've got 24 hours in a day, 18 of them roughly awake. We've got 18 hours a day to figure out how to make this successful. And that was what we had to do. And that was what we did. So we scaled. I wrote out uh, every sort of five years what goals we wanted to hit there was no science to this i promise you it wasn't like you know we worked it out on an algorithm there was no algorithm it also wasn't really based on the data there was no data in the industry it's still really hard to find data on the professional industry and if you look at it as the client report which will pay a few hundred dollars for it's complete i'm not going to say it's completely inaccurate but my segment of the industry which is some professional and the med spa it is inaccurate they have no concept of the size of the market. So, so they don't even differentiate between wholesale and no, retail. No. We have that personal care with one of our businesses. Yeah, yeah. So um, I did it in five-year increments. And when we did a million the first year, I said we should do 10 million in five years. And then we should do 20 million in 15 years. And, it, and I, went, I took it out to 100 million. And I just decided, you know, if we were doing 100 million, I don't know, I'd be dead by then because it would be, how could you even possibly do that? That just didn't even seem possible. So I did it to 100 million. And along with the, the dollar number, I put down what we would be known for and what the product line would look like. And I have to say, as creepy as it is, it really it wasn't far short. We 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 did it quicker than, than I thought it would happen, but it wasn't far short. And and the statement, the mission was always the same, the purpose, the why was always the same. And that was to one sentence, it was to define and bring respect and success to professional skin therapists through excellent education, um, outstanding innovative product, and outstanding customer service, which I recommend you just about two months ago, we changed that last bit of customer service to human connection, because that's actually what it was. And we never varied from that. So it was all about making the skin therapist successful, defining what they did and bringing them respect. So we didn't say the saddle, it wasn't the brick and mortar, it was the person. The person had to be successful. We weren't talking about some inanimate object like a building. You know, the salon, what does that, it's not the building, it's the person. So it was professional skin therapists, we had to define them, which meant we would define what the work was. That was our training. There would be excellent education and it had to be excellent. And it couldn't, if we were going to bring respect and success, it couldn't be gimmicky. We couldn't introduce any product to classes that was like magic boob lifters or magic <laughs> miracle, you know, wrinkle reducers. Or the, the dermatologist has never come up with that. I mean, to come up with the name of the product that wouldn't say silly, gimmicky, and wouldn't age. I wasn't my name, wasn't named up for me, because then how far can you grow that? I'll be dead one day, and then where are you? So it was very, it was one sentence, but it nailed down. It took us three days to write that sentence, by the way, arguing like crazy all together in a group of five. Um, it did define our, our bigger purpose, which was to make other people successful. So much in there to sort of unpack, but one of the things that sticks with me is that when there's no plan B and things that have to happen, have to happen, tend to happen. Things that would sort of be nice, mm -hmm. don't. When, you, when you're, things that in my life that have gone well are when I'm fully committed. Fully. There's, there was never even a sense that we could fail. Right. I mean, consider it. Right. Things that I'm sort of like one foot on the dock, one foot in the boat. Yeah. 
Ms. Destin. Yeah. And so just hearing that, and you know, there's a difference between the first time and the second, third, and fourth time after you've had some success. The first time you don't even consider it. No. Uh, you'll hear that over and over again. Um, Kai Moore. There's Kai. Do you have a question? Yeah, about, uh, I have a question about, I can talk to you about the right? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Okay, so I, I had a question about how it was um, selling your company to a community, like a bigger corporation. Was it hard to relinquish any of the creative control or anything like that? It's a great question. Um, I talk a lot about it in the book because it was a process, as everything is. So, Raymond and I, as I, as I told you, we never had outside investors. We were highly profitable. Um, the gross margin in the professional industry, professional, well, successful brands in the professional industry is a minimum of 75% gross margin. Many are in the 80s and 90s. It's, it's not like any other industry. And you need that kind of margin because there is a huge spend on promotion, advertising, um, you know, below the line, get the purchase, whatever it might be. There's a lot that goes with creating a prestige brand that's aspirational, you know, whether it's in fashion, whether it's in, in beauty, whether it's in skincare. And I differentiate between beauty and skincare. Beauty to me is makeup uh, and nails, but skincare is a separate category. So but this is just an, the piece of it. We were very profitable. So we didn't need to give away any equity to raise more money to, as an exit strategy. So Raven and I had owned the company for 30 odd years. And, you know, we're looking at each other and we're, we're now married. We have two kids who are now, you know, in, in their teens. And we said, you know, what's, what's our plan here? I was in my 50s, Ray was in his 60s. And I think you know, the death rate holds steady at 100%. So at some point, <laughs> the decision is going to be made for you. So here were the options. Do we want to go for an IPO, which people, a lot of people told us we should think about it. No. And the reason is, Ray and I know each other. We know ourselves. We don't play well in the sandbox for other people. I don't want to report to one person, let alone a bunch of shareholders, so the answer is no to an IPO. We didn't, we had a, I mean, I don't want to, be crass, but it wasn't ever about the money from the beginning for us. You know, it was a much bigger story for us. And I think if you're pursuing something that is truly is become your purpose, rewards come. However, you frame that, the rewards are different in in every situation. So that wasn't appealing. Um, should we take on a partner? We didn't need a partner, and again, we don't play well in the sandbox. So that meant, should we leave it to our children? Should we have our children take over? We'd already said no to that, you know, before they were even conceived, because we said, no matter how talented those children are, they will always be seen as having the company because we were the parents, number one. And number two, what are the odds that they would ever feel their dream purpose was to have a skincare company? I'm sure they want to do something else. And this will just be a huge burden that they'll never be as hugely good at it because they're not passionate about it and then we'll always think why did we do that there will be a huge family conflict and that proved to be true our youngest child studied criminal justice at the university of maryland wants to be in the fbi she's right now working for a non-profit in baltimore with that goal and our eldest is 28 and is uh, an up-and-coming artist here in, in los angeles and has a big ex um, exhibition of their erotic art at the Tom of Finland in Cleveland exhibit this year. So completely different from what we did. And so, no, our kids were not going to take it. So now we decided, okay, then it's going to be an acquisition. And this is a bit of a long answer to question, but it was a bit of a journey. So the acquisition, okay, so we're going to sell. We, we sell to, what are we going to do? Well, first of all, it's not going to be an earn out. We, we, we want out. If we're going, we're exiting. You know, you Explain leave, what an earn out is. Yeah, leave the party before your dress is wrinkled, your makeup smeared, and you forgot your bag. All right? <laughs> so you get everything together and you exit. Leave while you're looking good. That was advice given to me by my mum, and I will say, I think it's very true. <laughs> so um, we're going to go for an acquisition. We're going to sell, and we're not going to do an earn out. We're going to do a cash sale. We decided that. So whoever was going to be in the room, that was the criteria. We then said, who, who would it be that would buy us? And we said, there's a list of usual suspects. You know the people in your industry. So the usual suspects, I mean, it's 
not any secret. These were for a prestige skincare brand, highly profitable, with a proven concept. It's going to be L'Oreal, it's going to be Luda, it's going to be Shiseido, it's going to be probably Procter and Gamble. Uh, there'll be a few outliers. We, you know, everyone talks about the mystery company that nobody expected. And for us, that was you know, Luda. No, no one really expected them to come to the table. And that came about because I had come to on the radar of Paul Pullman, who was then the CEO of Unilever, through our advocacy work for women and underserved minorities at the UN. And Paul was on the board of UN Women. So he knew me for that activism work. He didn't know Don Logica, but we then later found out he took 10 years, Unilever took 10 years to study us before we went, before we announced secretly, and it was secret, that we're thinking about doing something. Unilever, uh, the reason we chose Unilever was the value system matched. And for me, that is everything. The people you hire, the people you marry, the people you go into business with, the partners you may have, you, you may have nothing in common other than a value system. But if you don't have the value system in common, I don't believe it can be successful. So Raymond and I came from different countries. He's South African, I'm Scottish. We have different religions. I was born into an Anglican family. He's, he's Jewish. Um, we came from completely different backgrounds. He went to university. I went to study you know, skincare. None of that mattered. What mattered was that we had an aligned value system. That made us great business partners and it happened to also make us great life partners and parents. Unilever and our value system was aligned. Um, people, planet, profits in that order. And because of that, that was, I mean, the story's a bit longer, it's in the book, but uh, that was how we came to Unilever. And it's now seven years, I'm still involved. Um, they have done incredibly well with Dermalogica, and even in, in this, in the last times, well into double digit growth year on year. So it's good and it's still fun. <laughs> That's a great answer. Thanks for sharing all of yeah. that with us. Yeah. Even with all the entrants, you think about who doesn't have a skin line in Hollywood right now. Everyone yeah. does. A totally <laughs> different world. But even with all of those entrants, all yeah. that competition, dermatologists still has double digit growth. Yeah. That's great. Um, Ashlyn? Ashlyn, you had a great question you posted. On, uh, I think it was on purpose, maybe, or being entrepreneur in your life. Ashlyn. Oh, I'm right here. Hi. You're going to have to speak up loudly. Um, so basically, I watched your um, like Q and A on YouTube, on the Dermalogica like YouTube channel, and you mentioned the importance of like being the entrepreneur of your own life, finding yeah. your purpose. Yeah. So, um, what steps do you take in finding your purpose, and then how did that lead you to create something specifically in like the field of skincare, and how do you, do you use your purposes to reflect or act on your like, your successes and failures? What was the last little bit? How do you use your um, purpose you use to reflect? Your purpose to reflect and um, act on successes and failures. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I believe, you know, I, I am an entrepreneur, but many people are intrapreneurs as, you know, they, they, they function like an entrepreneur within a company. They're highly creative, they're risk takers, et cetera, et cetera. Usually not in the not in the legal or finance department, because the risk taking isn't isn't a big, you know, <laughs> sort of an accolade there. But um, I I think that you if you're an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, regardless of whether you are either of those in business, every single one of us is the entrepreneur, the founder and entrepreneur of our own lives. So whatever we end up doing. To be self-determined in doing it, for me, is the ultimate freedom. I think that's what independence is. To me, success is opportunities, options, and choices at every level. But however you want to cut that, it's opportunities, options, and choices. That's freedom because it allows you to decide what in the heck you want to do. So coming from that... I believe you have to find the thing that really is your bigger why. 
I know it sounds a bit esoteric to say, why am I here? And this, indeed it is. But there is some, I believe every one of us is here for uh, a self-determined purpose. I believe it wholeheartedly. I think our job in this life is to find out what that is. And quite honestly, some people are asleep at the wheel of their own life and they don't even bother looking. But that's fine. I just don't think you live a very happy life like that. I don't care how much wealth you have. I don't think you will live a happy life if you feel um, determined. I, what does it really mean? And so having said that, how do you find your why? What is your bigger why? Why are you here? And it has to start with what do you care about? What is it that you do or are going to do or you're planning to do or you wish to do that actually makes a difference, not in your life, but in someone else's life? And if you can't come up with one, it's not a why. It's not a bigger why. Why must benefit it can benefit you, it's a given, but here's the thing I, I know to be true. If it doesn't benefit at least one other person, it's not going to benefit you. Not long term, not enough to sustain a life. And we all know there's the quick in and out and, and you know, the quick flip. That, that's a completely different thing. That's not finding a purpose. That's coming up with a smart business idea and growing it a bit and flipping it. That's a, that's a different thing. So you find your why. Let's say you find it. You go, you know what I think? And, I'm, and if you want a clue of how to find it, it's something that has probably already happened in your life. I spoke about my father dying. I spoke about my mother's self-determination. And that became my why. We were teaching skin therapists to be more successful. They needed product to be able to sell, to have a professional, um, a profitable business in a salon. You have to have product that you sell and you have to offer services. Otherwise, you're going to max out on the services as soon as you're fully booked. So I knew to make a skin therapist successful, we had to provide both training for the services and product for the retail sale, that would make them more successful. And if they were more successful, we would be too. And they would also create jobs which would make other people successful. And this would be in an industry with a skill set that, quite honestly, is incredibly disrespected. Most people, we've all heard the joke of you're in my industry, if you're not smart enough to do anything else, you go to beauty school. We've all heard that. Is it true? No, it's not true at all, because it's not how smart you are. It's how are you smart? And that's very different. And we don't give enough recognition to how are you smart? Some people are the most educated. You will know someone like this who's incredibly educated. Inc maybe they have incredible degrees, doctorates. Maybe they're a doctor. In fact, I'm thinking of a doctor I know right now. Couldn't take the top off of job if, it, if his <laughs> life depended on it. He's a brilliant surgeon. And I am baffled as to how he even finds his way into the operating room because he is incapable of finding his way out of his own neighborhood. But it's not how smart you are, it's how are you smart? And we have to keep recognizing that. So once you've found your why, and it benefits at least one other person, that's still static. It becomes an action when it becomes your purpose. A purpose, doing something on purpose is an action. It's not a thought. It's not a good idea. It's not, oh, I bet that could be successful if I did it. Those are all daydreaming and, and philosophical. Purpose, when you find your purpose, that will drive you. It's like the ignition switch in a car. Car looks exactly the same, but guess what? It's moving. It's now moving. That purpose is your ignition switch. It starts with your why. Your why will be found in something in your life that has authentically, truly happened to you, probably looking at everyone's ages, because I believe that happens by the time you're between nine and 12, at least, or before. Something then, one of the questions I ask entrepreneurs that I mentor or people that want to be an entrepreneur, what did you love to do between the ages of nine and 12? Now, I don't know what it was, I will tell you for me, I can trace it all the way back to what I ended up doing. I had a dog called Mary Makeup, and I like putting makeup on her, and I like taking it off with, with a little cleansing sponge that came with the dog. 
And my mother used to say, I don't know why you keep fussing around with that doll's face. Because she was a nurse and she thought I should be doing something more serious. I love that face. Love that face. And my best gift I got when I was eight years old was a tube of Avon Pretty Peach Hand Cream. Because I love that whole idea of that. So somewhere between the ages of nine and 12, my theory is it came knocking on your door. You may not have seen it. You may not have opened the door to it. But you know what it was. And don't think it's crazy that somehow that will thread, somehow it will thread into what you're going to do. And when that happens and it benefits at least one other person, that's your ignition switch. That becomes your purpose. And when you are purpose driven, not profit driven, you will have a very happy, sustained life. That is a master class. Yeah, snap, snap, snap. Oh, thank you. Uh, I mean, think about uh, was it week one or week two when uh, Dr. Ben Holbrook came to talk about the, the science of purpose? And he talked about three things that have to be present for purpose. The first one that was personally meaningful to you. The second one that was intrinsically motivating, was so important that you would work on it diligently daily. And the third one was purpose beyond the self. There is no purpose without <laughs> Uh, Peter Diamandis from last week, he didn't say in the class, but he said, you want to make a billion dollars? Help a billion people. Also true. Um, so hearing the practical side of purpose line up with the research side of purpose uh, is really rewarding to hear you say all that. And, and so as a 20 year old, and purpose is not your occupation. Purpose is not your career. It's not your job. She said it will line up. It'll weave into that somehow. And so don't think that as of now at 20 years old, you have to find the capital P purpose right now. Um, and I also think that you don't necessarily find it necessarily. Yeah. I think maybe it finds you once you start really working on something that you enjoy. So, and she talked about movement in the car. Again, Mark Burnett, you know, a survivor, apprentice, you know, the, the voice said, you know, while you're sitting at home with your, um, your no one <laughs> comes knocking on your door, right? It always is about movement and finding the next thing. So even if it's not exactly what you want to do, but it's sort of going in that direction, you got to keep moving because something will come from that in a derivative way. So yeah. while you're doing something that you really care about, yeah. it will start lining up for you. And it may not, the purpose may not change throughout your life. Her purpose sounds like it's been pretty consistent, but what you do and how you exemplify, exhibit, creatively express purpose may change. Now that she's not running dermologist, she finds different ways yeah. to express that purpose of empowerment. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little like I think Steve Jobs talked about this, you know, making the dots on paper. They seem random. And then you'll realize, you know, and when I talk about this, you know, when you were a child and they have those join the dot puzzles. That was like my favorite thing to do. So you're looking at the dots, you you're looking at all the dots are on the paper when you're looking at it, but you can't see what it is. Because what's missing? The journey between the dots, the line that connects those dots. Once you start connecting them and moving, that's when you start to see what it is a true picture. So this idea of movement, you may feel you're making random dots, like, oh, I don't know, you know, I didn't get into Australia, oh, then I'll go to America, oh, now I'm in California, oh, but there's an unemployment rate, but no one knows what I'm doing. I've done the most stupid thing. I could should have stayed in London and just, you know, worked for Elizabeth Arden in the salon where I did my apprenticeship. So it seems random, but keep moving because you are now the line between the dots. And once you make a little bit of a journey, you're going to start to look at those bunch of dots that you looked at before and say, wait a minute, hang on. You know, it's a zebra or whatever the heck it is. <laughs> you didn't see it when you were looking at the dots. You only saw it when you started moving to connect them. They will all connect, I promise you. And if you make a little detour because it's not right, you're going to feel it. So you're going to see, oh, that doesn't, where was number 18? Oh, oh, it's over here. Okay. You can erase that. It's okay. We've all gone off road. It's okay. You get back on it because you'll quickly feel it's not right. You'll quickly feel You've compromised yourself in some way. This isn't right. It shouldn't be this tough. It should be smooth. A river isn't a straight line, but water finds its way, and it always does. 
Sometimes it's rapid. Sometimes it, if you go into a tide pool, into a side water, you're going to feel it because it doesn't feel the same as being in the flow of the river. And that's what you've got to trust. You know, people say it's intellectual or scientific. It's also how you feel about it. Don't underestimate that. Your body may even tell you. I've, I've been thinking about this in my life. There are a couple instances where I was making a decision or interviewing for a job. Yeah. And my body was fighting. It was like shaking, mm -hmm. not of nervousness, but like, don't do this. Yeah, don't do this. I went, went in the next room to like do push ups and try and like get my yeah. breathing and like my body going. And I was fighting it. I had the worst interview ever. It was terrible. They still gave me the offer, but like, I it was like, it was like, it was like trying to pump myself up. Like, like my body was fighting. I think yeah. of a couple of times. So your body will tell you those. You got to listen. Uh, Will had a question about success and failure. You at, you answered that in terms of your definition. It's freedom and liberty and options to be who you are, so having choices. Um, but I want to talk about what are your KPIs. I want to heard terms KPI, right? Key performance indicators. And so you just finished this assignment on success and failure, and those metrics are your KPIs. And so the easy metric for people to think about is money. How do you make a lot of money? Well, if you want to make a lot of money, you know. I wouldn't say just work be an entrepreneur. In, work, in work in finance. Yeah, yeah. Work, in, work for the national mint. Go, go attach yourself <laughs> to big numbers. Be a hedge fund manager, be an investment banker, yeah. because it's just a higher likelihood that you'll make a lot of money. Uh, but what are your KPIs? And I used to, you know, I, I was a poor kid. And so I wanted to make money. I came to USC and my eyes lit up. I'm like, wow, I want to live like they live. You know, I saw the cars and the lifestyle that, that students had here. And I was like, I want to live like that. And I think in my mind, I always thought I am financially motivated. Now, sure, certainly being a lawyer and making good money, that was all great, starting a business. But I, I wound up thinking that like my, my KPIs are I want to live an original life. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live a mediocre life. I want to have excitement. I want to have complete flexibility, not a ton of accountability. And I've, I've created that life. But it's interesting that you have to think about and really be intentional about what your KPIs are. Mm -hmm. You know, what are your things that, that you measure success by? Well, freedom, definitely. Uh, freedom to be exactly who, who any of us are. For me, that meant freedom to be able to speak my mind. That meant freedom to be able to own my uh, ideas. Freedom to be um, taken seriously in a job that I love. Now that might sound, sound quite broad, but that actually rules out emigrating to a lot of countries that you would, I wouldn't, as a, as a woman, uh, experience those kind of freedoms. So oddly enough, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty starts to narrow it down. Um, I think a KPI for me is yes, financial independence, because in the world that we live in, without financial independence, a lot of opportunities and choices are taken away from you. You just don't have access to it. I want full access. I want that full, you know, any of the rock concerts, that full VIP pass, that's the one I want. Because I want to go backstage. I want to go back with the band. I want to go out to dinner. I want to get a drunk be a drunky monkey in that room with everyone else having fun. I don't want to just go home after the concert. I want full pass access. And I want the press pass because I want to be able to write about it the next day. So that's... So if you wanted to live an original life, I wanted to live an original life too, but my original life. So that to me is, is really important. And a KPI for me is also kindness. Um, it is not necessary to be unkind or cruel in any situation. I don't care what it is. I don't care when you are, when you need to let someone go, you need to fire somebody, that can happen. There are ways to do that with great kindness and empathy, not condescension. That's a completely different thing. Not pity. That's a completely different thing. But with active kindness, is this your best self? Are you always being your best self? And I say that because that's what we should strive for, because otherwise you're being less of yourself. Do you want that? Don't shrink yourself is one of my KPIs. If I'm required to shrink myself in any way, like don't speak too loud, don't put your hand, don't ask a question, that I won't shrink myself. I can't shrink myself. That just wouldn't be honoring 
my, my parents, the, the legacy of, of Vikings and Scots and pirates. Yes, a well-known pirate in my ancestry DNA. So I, I have all these crazy thoughts like that. Like I cannot shrink myself. I'm not going to sit on my hands, but I'm also not going to be unkind. I'm not afraid to be confrontational, but I won't be rude. So I, the, all of that is, is my KPIs. I, I want to feel that I did my best, and if I didn't, when I put like some book two, I will be the first to apologize and apologize properly. Not, I'm sorry you were so sensitive. That you know, <laughs> that's not an apology. That's like a lame ass way of blaming the other person. So I'm sorry I did that. That wasn't my best self. I, I'm embarrassed about it. And I hope you can forgive me. And say it, I mean it. And it's the only way you're going to feel better about yourself anyway. You don't do that. And it lingers in you far longer than it lingers in the other person. Much longer. The only things that I think you'll really regret in life is probably the times that you're really unkind to someone. Yeah. And that you hurt someone else. You know? Yeah. Uh, and if you could have written it, and now 20 years later, you have it right here. It sits yeah. with you. Um, Lucia, are you here? Lucia had a great question on fear. Uh, Maybe she's too fine for us. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Hey, uh, Lucia. Look at that. Hi. Um, so my question, thank you for coming, first of all. Um, you have previously discussed how success is not about not having fear, but instead it's about being able to function when you are scared to death. What are some tactics or advice on overcoming that daunting fear that wants to prevent you from taking risks? Um, I'm thinking about the last piece that you said about taking risks. I, yeah, I, Taking, you know, often it's said about entrepreneurs that you're great risk takers. I actually, when, when you're doing it, other people think what you're doing is risky, but you probably feel like maybe it's never been done before, but it's not that you feel inherently you're taking a risk. In fact, the risk, in fact, the opposite. You actually feel that what you're about to do is the right thing. <laughs> you could be wrong, but... And none of us are natural risk takers as much as some of us are willing to put ourselves on the edge of the cliff to see that scary view down and not stand back where the sheep are because sheep are never on the edge of the cliff. I mean, if they were, they'd fall off, which is a problem. They're back a few feet or a few yards. But right there is where it feels so dangerous. It feels risky. It's not. You're on solid ground. But that feeling is what we're willing to take on. Does that make sense? It's sort of exhilarating in a strange way. So how do you overcome the fear? Well, first of all, understanding that we're all afraid at certain times of all kinds of different things. There's people have phobias about things that might not scare you, but terrify them. So we all carry a certain degree of fear and courage and bravery is not the absence of fear. It is the ability to continue even though you're scared to death. And so how do you get comfortable with being scared? I, I'll tell you, I shared the story at the beginning when I was five. That was about the most scary thing I'd ever done was telling that teacher, telling my class, that my, that my dad, I didn't have a dad and, and he was dead. And it was unheard of. So unheard of that the stupid permission slip had to be signed by a father. I mean, how crazy is that? And right in that moment, I stepped into my fear. So I think exposure is probably the best way to help us overcome our fears. Not that you're never going to be scared again. I was scared, stuck on the 10, coming here tonight, that I was actually going to be an hour late. And then I realized there isn't really a lot of point in being scared. You've got to figure out a bloody plan. Now, what are you going to do? Get that waves file up on the phone and find another way through. Call Natalie the actor and say, go in and answer questions for me until I get there, please. I can figure something out. And for me, that is how you step into your fear. You figure out a crazy plan B of some description that probably doesn't make any sense, but at least you can reassure yourself that you have a go-to. Meanwhile, 
double down and get sorted out with what you're meant to be doing. That's the best advice I have. Can you talk to yourself in the mirror? Yes, if that helps. Um, I do tell a story in my book with a teacher who was microphone for us, who went into the bathroom on a break to give herself a talk, and the microphone was still hot and live to the students in the auditorium. And she couldn't go back into the classroom and she actually left her job right there and then got on her car and drove away and never came back. Because she had been mortified that she'd have to walk back in the class and they had heard her in the restroom saying, you can do this. Pull yourself together with a few, you know, swear words in. Pull yourself together. You can do this. <sighs> and breathing. And of course, the students are like, what is going on? And I said to her, you have to go in there and you have to own it. And she said, I cannot. I'm getting in my car and I'm driving away and I'm never coming back. And I said, no, you're not really. But she did really. <laughs> <laughs> what could she have done? You go in and you say to the class, oh my God, how crazy am I? Now you know the full extent of my madness. Let's move on and talk about skin histology. Why don't we? So whatever it is, just own it. What's the worst that can happen? That's I've heard this over and over again from really successful entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, think of what a bonding moment that would have been. They would have been yeah. in her palm of her hand the rest of the day if to, to like confess that type of vulnerability. <laughs> Sarah Blakely of Spanx was here a couple years ago, and she's like, we do require, like, the things that I do, I purposely embarrass myself yeah. to get accustomed to being in that feeling. Yeah. Um, their parents made them share their failures at the dinner table. Yeah. I talked to uh, the founder of Illumination Entertainment, yeah. you know, Minions, and, and it said, why did you know you wanted to start your own studio? He said, because nothing terrified me more, so I knew I had to do it. So the fear is indic indicative of something special there. Yeah. It may not be the right thing, but like on the other side is the bliss, especially yeah. if there's purpose behind it. Yeah. So look at that really interesting. And then the other part that that's a practice is if, if you do need that that self-talk, we all do, you gotta think about other times when you've dealt with something similarly. So I have the experience in this, I've done it before, <laughs> I've been successful before. We all go through that, mm -hmm. no matter how successful yeah. you are. So, and, and expose yourself. I remember many years ago, I was traveling uh, a lot internationally um, to teach and to introduce the product, usually on my own, because it was too expensive to travel with someone when you're starting up. You travel on your own flight trench and all the rest of it. So I remember being in, in Japan, and I don't speak Japanese, and I and I had ordered room service for like three nights in a row, and I was teaching there for about a month. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I cannot do this. I've got to get up and I've got to go out and get dinner. And I and then I would say to myself, but you don't know what you're going to order. You don't know the streets. You can't read any street names. What are you going to do? What is the worst that's going to happen? I'm going to walk into a restaurant. I'm going to look and see where everyone's eating. I'm going to like the look of any of it. I'll walk out into the next restaurant. I'll finally find a restaurant, surely, that I can just point to whatever someone is eating and say that, you know, as rude as that might seem, I can make myself known and I've got a credit card, I'll pay with that and I don't have to understand this or even, like, I can do it. And I forced myself, I made myself a promise that night and I did it. I have no idea what I ate. It wasn't very delicious, but I ate it. <laughs> but I made myself a promise that when I travel from now on, I do not order room service. The only time I order room service is if I get into the hotel very late, 11 o'clock, something like that, and I'm starving hungry. That is the only time. Otherwise, I am going out. I am eating alone. I'm sitting at a table. I am not looking at a phone. I'm not taking a book to read. I'm just going to sit at the table, I'm going to order my food, I'm going to have a drink, and I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to look around and see who else is there. Great travel advice, too. <laughs> I want to open it up for student questions now. Don't be bashful at all. Raise your hand if you got a question for Jane. Yeah. Do, I don't know if we want to use that mic. Does this mic cut out? <laughs> Let's test this one first. Does your mic still work? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. In the hands up. Of... Hands up right here. I want to say that your positivity from the beginning is has been extremely admirable. You are an incredible public speaker. We've all been talking about how you should be a motivational speaker if you're not already. Um, you brought up a point that um, you came here in January and by December you were on the road. When you came here in January, 
we just talked a lot about fear and everything like that. What drove you to walk in and start training right away? And I ask this because a lot of us seniors have these big plans and business ideas. And like, how, how do you get yourself to just walk in and say, you know what, this is what I'm doing. Here's my plan. And then start training people. Well, uh, rent, uh, <laughs> hunger, <laughs> you, you're going to have to figure something out, right? So I got here in the January of uh, 1983. And here was, here's what had happened, because it's obviously everything is, you know, in alignment. Uh, I'd been dating Raymond previously. We would split up because he, again, each piece of this is a long story, but I'll cut it short. He uh, had applied for a green card. Um, some years before, left the country because you have to leave the country as you apply for a green card, came back in on labor certification and got a green card, which is like getting the Willy Wonka golden ticket. You know, you, don't, you have 90 days to appear in America, in the United States to get your green card. And uh, if you don't come, you don't get it. So we were dating and he said, what do I do? And I said, don't be crazy, go. You know, it's the golden ticket, go. So he did. I saw him off at the airport, you know, kind of. But uh, that was that. Then I was working for an American company and I got a, a, a trip, a training trip actually, to Los Angeles. So that began when we, I found Raymond again. He had moved from Chicago to LA. And then we, we link up again. And I go back. I decide I'm emigrating. Three months later, I come. In that three months, Raymond had got a job as a sales rep, being paid commission only, no salary, no base, for a skincare equipment manufacturer out of Japan. Now, that manufacturer was selling skincare equipment that was extremely advanced. And obviously, based on what I already shared with you about the industry, Raymond was not selling any equipment because no one had the training to use it. But I did. So he was saying, I can't understand what's going on. There's no one has no one has these machines. I'm going in with Galvanic car and they go, what the hell is that? And I said, that's weird. Why not? We hadn't realized that we simultaneously both realized there isn't enough training to use this machine. So the end of January, Ray had a trade show in Long Beach and he had, was taking the machines it was for this Japanese company and he was working on the, on the stand. And he said, listen, I've got to sell at least one of these machines. I'm on commission only. Won't you come down to the trade show in Long Beach at the convention center and demonstrate using the machine? So I said, sure, do I get paid? And he said, no, I'll buy you lunch. I've got a lunch per <laughs> deal or something. So I said, okay, fine, no problem. So I go down, I'm on the stand. I've got a chair, I've got a bed that is he's being sold in a steamer and all this equipment. I know how to use it. And suddenly you'd think I was extracting teeth on that sand. There was like people standing around. Like, what is she doing? What is going on? Someone said, are you a dentist? <laughs> Not yet, but <laughs> who knows? And so I realized there was a thirst and an interest in this. Raymond sold five machines at that show. So we were eating for the next two months. He then said, you know what I think? I'm gonna pitch an idea to them that you come on a Monday, one Monday of, the, of every month to teach how to use these machines, we'll do a free class, and I think I'll sell some. So I said, fine, do I get paid for this? And he said, I'll see. They came back and said, they'll give me $100 to do a day's teaching. I, in, I'm in. <laughs> so I go and I teach, I get $100, Ray sells like three machines. So this is the gig, right, that we're doing. Then, Ray says to me, you had 70 people in your class. And I said 70 people, we rented 12 chairs. But there were 70 people who were sitting on the floor because there was nothing like this. And it was word of mouth. There was no advertising, no social media. There was no, you know, I'm on a TikTok telling people to come. <laughs> so Ray said, you had 70 people. I said, hey, you know what that means? I'm going to tell to Cora Belmont, which was the name of the company, don't pay me $100 a day. I'll do it for free. I'm charging everyone $10 to come. $10 isn't so much. So now I'm making $700 for a day, not 100. I'm very happy. I figure I could work, you know, two Mondays a month and I'm surfing, so that's all good. And then Raymond said, but when I went down to do this training at La Costa, you know what? We have a business. I said, 
I know, working two Mondays a month. <laughs> no, imagine if we open a school. Now, honestly, I was thinking, I think that's the last thing I want to do. I think I'm going to be working every day. But as we got into it, of course, I got excited. By December, we had enough to pay the rent, saved enough to pay the rent on 1,000 foot office in Marina Del Rey next to the Social Security office. And our rent was so cheap because it was next to the Social Security office. We paid $1,000 a month rent for that space. We then talked to Cara Belmont into making it a showroom and putting six sets, full sets of equipment that I could have the students use as I was teaching them the techniques and they wouldn't have to pay anything for the showroom. We would take a commission on the equipment. And that's how we did it. Very incredible. Well, no, just desperate. <laughs> Rent, food, clothing. That was sort of the, you know, the priorities then. Thank you. Yeah, you can figure it out, <laughs> truly. Hi, Jane. Thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit about your global presence with Dermalogica. Yeah. I want to ask, how were you able to successfully penetrate different cultural markets um, like effectively and be successful, for example, like Taiwan's extremely different from Australia. So I wanted to know, like, what was your research in that and how were you successful? No research. Um, the first thing, the first thing that happened was we went on trade shows in our industry that attracted international markets. So I uh, would do a trade show in Glasgow, we did, uh, which was a Sedesco trade show, it means nothing, but that was the name of the group. Cosmoprof, which is a good big trade show in Bologna, in Italy, and Cosmoprof in Hong Kong. Those are the three of the big trade shows. There's one in Vegas now um, as well. So I went on the trade shows. I usually managed to uh, speak on the main stage because no one was speaking about the American market. So I would go there to talk about the American market. Nobody knew that. Everyone wanted to know about it, blah, blah. When I would go on the international trade shows, I would take a booth and people would come up and ask about the classes and then about the product. And depending on our first market was Malaysia because they have a very well developed skincare industry there for professional skincare. And a skin therapist came up and said, my husband and I have a small distribution company and we'd love to take the product. And we liked them, we had dinner with them. That started one of our first rules that we never supplied to anybody that we didn't want to have dinner with. So I don't want to deal with people I really don't even want to have dinner with. You're going to be in a business relationship with them, forget it. You won't even have dinner. So that was like our first rule is we have to really want to have dinner with anyone. So, and we lived by these rules as crazy as it seems. So we had dinner with them, we liked them. They became our first distributor. So there was nothing scientific. I'd never been to Malaysia. I didn't know if the market was good. I did know I had a great skincare market though, because I'd done my training with several therapists who come from Malaysia and went back to work there. And so we put everything in the international market with who the distributor was. We generally went, we did not go to the big companies. We didn't go to the multinationals. They wouldn't have taken us anyway. We would find local entrepreneurs, often a family, often it would be a partner, partners, it would be a mother and son. I'm thinking in Israel, it was a mother and a son. In Malaysia, it was a husband and wife. In Norway, it was two sisters. So we normally, it was a familial, small entrepreneur who took on the line. We worked with them to make them successful as well. Uh, we provided them the workbooks, the training, the videos then, and the product. We brought them out every year for retraining. So we were building up this community of people that were distributing Dermalogica. And, and then we, we moved forward then into markets that we felt were, were important. Now, one lesson we learned very quickly, and that was actually in Taiwan. Taiwan told us, we can't do it the way you do it. It's a very different culture in Taiwan. Everyone works on a contract system. It's not the same as the industry here. We can't insist that therapists all wear white. You'll have to change the packaging because it's gray and white and they'll think that's ugly. Also, the name is a problem. I think we're going to have to rename it, Chinese name, blah, blah, blah. And we were persuaded because that seemed to all make sense. So we launched it their way and it was a complete failure. And after nine months, we pulled out and we regrouped. And we went back in about a year later with a different distributor. And this time we said, you understand your culture. That's why we have you in Taiwan. 
but we understand Demologica. Demologica doesn't change its clothing, it doesn't change its name, it doesn't change its personality wherever it goes. The same way that if any of you went traveling internationally, you would be influenced by everything you saw, heard, and felt there, but you would essentially be the same person. And so we then decided after that, that experiment, failed experiment in Taiwan, every market would launch the same way, the same product. We did not change the packaging. We did not change the name. We went in first with education, then the product. And they would put the market influence on the product by the way they introduced it, how they did their openings, how they did structure the opening deal, whether they took credit, whether they didn't, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody put baby in the corner. Nobody put Dermalogica in the corner. Dermalogica was front and central, and that personality never changed. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's kind of like when you go, if you go, whether you go to a Starbucks or whether you go to, uh, you know, in, in a high pick movie theater, whatever. If, a, if it's a brand, a brand has a voice and a personality. A product is a commodity. Commodities are not the things that are aspirational. They're the things that are necessary. But a brand is very different, and a brand must have a voice, a personality, and sound to something. Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for being here. I know that in other interviews, you talked about how you don't fully buy into the idea of work-life balance. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your perspective on it and how you manage different priorities in both your personal and um, yeah. professional life. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I've been, I've been doing this a long time. So if I span many eras, I feel like Yoda. Um, so when it first, you yeah. I first used to be asked, how do you balance work and, and your life? It would be kind of like that, like they were two completely separate things. And I have to just also say, being a little gender specific, especially then, that question, I never heard that question asked of anyone other than someone who identified as, as a woman. That was just the way it was. There is no such thing as balance. There's no such thing as any balance in anything. It's a big, messy life. So I don't believe in balance, I believe in resilience. Can you manage to do a ton of stuff at the same time well enough that you kind of manage to do most of it? Okay, that's enough. I didn't know if I could have a life and work. And then I realized, you know what? My work is one of the favorite parts of my life and I wouldn't have my work if I hadn't lived my life. So I don't think they're exchanged. I don't think they can be exchanged. Ray and I talk work and life all the time. I mean, People use, I have heard people say, you know, when I go home, mm -mm, I never talk about business. Really? Are you kidding me? You don't care enough about it then. Because we would walk in saying, can you believe that order from, you know, Germany didn't come into those pubs? What the hell are we going to do? And we'd be cooking dinner while we talked about the pubs. We'd be eating dinner as we argued about whether we could get the pumps from a different market that Germany had already supplied. Dead stock, dead stock. It's really dead stock in Australia. I mean, it never stopped because we loved it. This was part of who we were. We had children. People would say, how are you ever going to have children? This is ridiculous. No, it wasn't. We just involved them as well. They weighed in as well. And, and it's all a messy life. My, my five, six-year-old, Molly was six, and they said to me, Mommy, everyone's mommy brings something for the bake sale. And I said, I don't bake. And Molly said, I know, Mommy, but I can't go to school and say you don't bake. I said, and I got down on Molly's level, and I said, I know this means nothing to you now, Molly. I understand. And I will go and pick up donuts or something to take to school, so don't worry. But I want you to know that I can wax a bikini line in seven minutes. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But when you get to 14, you're going to be very happy that I can. <laughs> and that was true. <laughs> so it's all messy. My mom said to me once, if you're out of your pajamas by, with a new baby, if you're out of your pajamas by 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you've at least wiped your face if not washed it, it's a good day. You're doing good enough. It's all fine. Nothing is perfect. There's a concept in, in Japan called wabi-sabi. I'm sure many of you may know of it. Perfectly imperfect is a weird translation, but in other words, nothing is perfect. Ray Kawakubo has made a whole career out of holes in sweaters. 
They didn't have to be without holes. And they're fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I was just wondering what it was like to start a business with your then boyfriend, current husband, and like your thoughts on family businesses. Well, I would say something I referenced a bit earlier. Raymond and I dated because we had an alliance. Well, it wasn't why you dated. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons, as we all know, why you date someone, especially the first day. You know, you don't know anything about them, but they look great, so why not? <laughs> so it wasn't the first thing that attracted us to each other. But the thing that kept our relationship um, becoming solid was we had an aligned value system. The things we cared about were aligned. The fact that we cared about things were aligned. Uh, nothing, you know, it wasn't that we had things in common, but we had values in common. And those are two different things. So that lined up and that led to us marrying each other. But way before we married each other, we were we worked together for 10 years before we married each other. And the value system was, was the core piece. I worked with Raymond before we had any kind of relationship other than work, and we respected each other a great deal. We both worked for the same cosmetic company, and we respected each other's opinions a great deal. He respected my creativity and my ideas on product. I respected his marketing savvy and his operational savvy. So that had already been worked out. And then we started uh, a personal relationship. We already had that respect for each other built in. I think, well, not I think, I see that being more successful in my now many years of observing this than the opposite. When people start a relationship first and then go into business together, then they've defined their respect by their relationship. And I, and I, and I don't know that it's as good. Does that make sense? It's a very unproven theory, but it's one I keep testing and it keeps proving to be somewhat correct. Yeah. Hi. Hi, thanks so much for uh, coming in. Um, you tweeted a couple months ago about managing people's demands for attention and kind of prioritizing based on who cares about you, who you care about, and who helps you kind of further your purpose. Yeah. Do you have any reflective practices that help you narrow those people down, narrow those moments down? Essentially, how do you set those boundaries? Uh, I have someone who's worked for me, with me and for me for over 10 years, Natalie, who's sitting right here. So she, will, she knows this. Um, the first thing is I always trust my instinct. I don't always, in fact, I hardly ever understand why my instinct is saying that to me, and I don't have to. I trust it. So I don't have to have a reason why I get a feeling about somebody. Doesn't mean the person's not a great person. It just means that this person would not be great in anything to do with me. I just trust it. So that's my first red flag, as I say. That would be my first no, right? I just don't, I was not feeling it. The second thing would be, um, I don't work with flakes. So if somebody's not reliable, they may be fabulous, charming, great, funny, hysterical, a great dancer, whatever, lots of ticks in the boxes. But if they're a flake, not for me, because I'll drive them absolutely crazy because I'm, I, I'm committed. I believe in commitment. So Anyone I've ever worked with, like a photographer for my kids' bat mitzvahs, all the way through to people I've hired to develop products, my question to them is, you know, just to ask you, and no right or wrong answer, are you a flake? You know if you are. <laughs> and your family do too. If you're confused, ask them. They'll know. If you're a flake, it's absolutely fine. It's your life. But we will not work well together. So bail now. You don't even have to tell me if you are or not. Just leave now <laughs> because it's never going to work. I'll drive you crazy and it won't work out well for either of us. So that's my second red flag. If that all goes smoothly, like I'm having a good feeling and they're not a flake and they don't seem to be a flake, then I'm really, um, it all depends on what they're asking me for and what they're asking me to do. And you have to have priorities. You've got 
so much time in a day. And if you say yes to everything because you want to be a people pleaser, or you want people to like you, or you like to be of help to people so you don't like to say no, any of those kind of reasons, you will not have enough time to say yes to the things that really light you up. There just isn't enough time. So you sometimes you have to say no, not for me. That sounds wonderful. I love that for you. That was the phrase my, my daughter taught me <laughs> many years ago. I love that for you, mommy. <laughs> I love that for you. So what do you think of these? So it's like this goes back, right? And my daughter said, I love that for you. <laughs> no, not for me. So I think you have to prioritize whether this is something, it's okay that they've said yes, they're excited about it. I'm excited about it for you. I love what you were telling me about, about this. You want me to go to Uganda with you. This is a true story. I mean, I, you want me to go to Uganda with you and start a nonprofit venture for girls there uh, I, I, in textiles. I love that for you. I think that sounds fantastic. I am not your person. That's not, that doesn't work into any of, of my priorities for all kinds of reasons. I've got a full book. We've all got a garden to read and here it is. You know, so I, I have no problem in, in saying no. And sometimes I say yes to things that people would want me to say no to, Natalie, because I just feel like doing it. And that's okay. I trust that too. Um, when I was raising my kids, I told them the three priorities I had as a parent was to keep them in this order of priority, safe, healthy, happy. That's the order, right? So I'm not going to let you do something that's unsafe. You can't do something that would be healthy but is unsafe. You also can't do something that will be, make you happy but is neither safe nor healthy. It has to be in that order. If it's safe, and it's how and it's going to be not detrimental to your health, and it would make you happy. Okay, now we can talk about it. And I was just always strict on it. And so I, I, I encourage you to find whatever three things become your red flags and live by them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming to speak today, Jane. I was actually really excited to hear you speak because I actually listened to your episode on how I built this with Guy Ross. And in that, you discuss um, where your working relationship with your chemist didn't necessarily go to plan. It was really interesting to hear you speak today about how, how you try to work with people who have similar values to you. So I was just wondering how you handle situations in which those values maybe fall out of alignment. Oh, that is a great question. Um, so, and again, you can read this in the book. If you, if you, I hope you read the book. If you don't, read the last page because it's got the best things in the book and then you learn to buy the book. But anyway, um, yeah, I tell the story of the chemist. So uh, we were driven. We wanted 27 formulas. Raymond said, can you describe the products you see in your head? And that's, that is a talent and a gift I have. I can see things finished before I've begun them, whether it's a meal or a product or... Ooh, Ooh, it's like no in the dark. Oh, that's getting exciting for a minute. Um, I can see it finished. So I, I said, yes, I described 27 formulas in, on paper, uh, exactly what I wanted, three cleansers, one toner, it had to be in a spray, two moisturizing creams, uh, three boosters, three serums, and no one even knew what the word serum was then, which, you know, I think about that often now because it's the hardest category in, in skincare. But I um, I sat down and, and decided these are the formulas and now we have to find a chemist. Now, when you've got no money to pay a chemist, you're going to be narrowing your field. Mm -hmm. So I started off by, I'm gonna try and make this quick. We wanted to formulate with very few chemicals in the product. Uh, especially mineral oil, lanolin, color, fragrance, formaldehyde, uh, SD alcohol, um, lanolin, did I say lanolin? Okay, so we, this is my, do, will not formulate with these for reasons you can read that. Will not formulate with these. Can I find a chemist that can make a product using many more botanicals? And the answer was, no one really understood what I was talking about. So a chemist, one of the chemists I spoke to um, said to me, you should call the supplier of botanical ingredients. They're out of New Jersey. Their name is Tri-K Botanicals, it still is. And ask them what chemists they supply in Los Angeles because 
you should start with working with chemists that know how to formulate with essential oils and not fragrances. This is 1985. So I did that, and that was that was a great signpost because they gave me a list of 70 chemists that they worked with, and I literally sat on the phone. There were no emails, there was no internet. I sat on the phone and phoned every single one of them. Most wouldn't take my call. I narrowed it down to about 12 that would. Of the 12, five said that they felt they could make the product without using formaldehyde, which was a key preservative then. Um, and also gave me the clue that we have to use contamination-free packaging if we weren't going to use formaldehyde, which actually became one of our selling assets. We have no jars, we've never had jars, it's all tubes and pumps and so all of it fell into place and made sense. All of it made the product better, but we got down to three that could actually felt they had the time and the bandwidth and the space to make the product, and only one would do it without an upfront payment. And that was the one time I was forced to compromise my value system in a way, not that he was, you know, an axe murderer or anything, which probably would be a deal breaker, had I known that. <laughs> Maybe, but uh, we were really forced to, to work with this one person and he was a brilliant chemist and he did come, come with the product. And the, the momentous, most disastrous, I thought, most disastrous day of my career was when he told us a month before we launched, he would not release the formulas to us because he owned the formulas. We formulated a two year buyback of the formulas because one thing I will tell you, you're never going to move to an acquisition if you don't own your own formulas. You can't just slap a label on it and sell it and, as your own. It's not yours and you have nothing to sell, right? So we knew that from having spent our careers in the cosmetic business. So we had to own formulas. We figured a buyout over two years and he came a month before, before we launched and said he needed to buy a car and he wanted to be paid out now. And he would not release the formulas until we did. And uh, we came up with a way to, to give him money to pay him off. We borrowed $20,000 off a friend uh, on a credit card. Well, we asked him to sign a surety for $20,000 on a credit card. He did. We promised him we'd pay him back in a month because that was when we were going to launch Dermalogica on a trade show. We did it. And that January, when we launched Dermalogica, it was 1986. And that was the year we did a million dollars. And we owned everything we owned. So that chemist with a misaligned value system actually turned out to be Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> we got the gold, he flew out the window, and we never saw him again. Anyone <laughs> have one more question? Time for one more question. Jane, thank you so much for your time. Uh, yeah. Your time is both precious and priceless, so why spend two hours with us? <laughs> I love that. What, I've never been asked that. Um, <laughs> David is very persuasive. No, that wasn't it. I, it's really simple. My purpose is in, in any way I can to help people live a self-determined life. And I believe education is the key to that. And if I can be helpful to anyone's education, I will be. And it's, it's um, often at university level, but more often it's at skill set vocational level. Uh, we're running programs at Cal State Northridge and several of the Cal State universities. We're also running at community colleges where they're teaching aesthetics. Anywhere where someone's learning how to do something or learning something will help them do something in the future, uh, especially potential entrepreneurs, I'm all over it like a rash. <laughs> Thank you. And a quick second question. Uh, as a fellow Jew, how, if at all, has your Jewish identity played into your career and success? Uh, my Jewish identity has played into my success in the value system, uh, and that the key value system for me in Judaism is family, kindness, empathy, and good deeds. Thank you. Taking notes, we're going to come to you in a second, and I want to finish sort of where we started. We started talking about your family and upbringing and your mom and uh your mom got to see you know 15 16 years of dermalogica yeah um what did she make of this of this global company that you built you know uh, how did she brag about you, you know, towards her later years well my mom 
didn't really brag, um, but my mom, uh, first of all, she always said, you know, don't get ahead of yourself. That was always her thing. It's all very well. I know people, you know, very successful. I'm very proud of you, but don't let it go to your head. But at the very end of my mom's life, um, she had Alzheimer's, early stage Alzheimer's. And there were times where she didn't really know who I was, let alone what I had done. And a few months before she died, uh, and she died in, in 2001, a few months before she died, I went to see her in England, and um, I went every six weeks to see her when she wasn't feeling well. And she was in hospital, and in England, you don't have a private room, you have a ward. So there was someone in the bed, you know, sort of over the curtain from her, and the curtains were drawn back. And I was giving my mum a manicure because when I was doing my training, she was my guinea pig, and I used to give her a manicure every single night. And I'd do anything. I mean, if you stand still long enough, I would, you know, do something to you because I was training and had to pass my apprenticeship. So I, I was giving my mum a manicure and doing her nails, and she was sitting in bed and watching me. And I wasn't sure if she knew who I was or she thought I was someone that came in, but I felt she did. And then the woman next to her said, Oh, that looks nice. And my mom turned to her and said, thank you. And she looked at me and said, my daughter's a qualified manicurist, you know. <laughs> and I realized she'd remembered that. And that was everything. I'd learned how to do something. She knew I was successful at it. She might have forgotten everything else. It didn't matter. Right there doing her nails, she was really proud of me. And I was very happy and really proud. Well, students, Jane has been here twice, and I don't know how to repay her for the things that she's given us. It just really is one of those things that I think I learn as much as you do. Uh, I go back and watch this, and uh, it's been a master class. So I want you to think about the lessons and advice that she shared with us today, and what things will you take away and remember five, ten years down the line? I know there's a ton. And I'm going to record them and give them to you. All right? Who's ready with a lesson or quote? Hands up. All right, I'm going to come this way and I'm going to come around. So I'm counting on you guys over there to bring it home. Ready? Ready? Speak up loudly. Go. Success is opportunities, options, and choices. No one is going to cut you a break. It's not how smart you are, it's how you are smart. Water always finds its way to the present the book. Uh, learn your story and have it yourself. Learn how to do something. Find the thing that is your bigger why. Your authentic story will be your north star. Don't shake yourself. It becomes an action when it becomes your purpose. You can always shift shame into violence. Never go against your values. Be purpose driven, not profit driven. If it doesn't benefit someone else, it doesn't benefit. What do you care about? What's the worst thing that can happen? Exposure is the best way to overcome your fears. Own your authentic story. Continue even though you're scared to death. If you're pursuing something that's truly your purpose, we work with you. Don't underestimate how you feel about it. Prioritize what really lights you up. It's not how smart you are, it's how, how you are smart. <laughs> You have 18 hours a day to figure out how to make your plans. Success is opportunities, options. Always trust your instinct. Please thank. <laughs> She has something she has to go to. She's got to run, so we can't really spend much more time with her. Have a great week. We'll see you next week, Peter. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.